Greetings, true believers, and welcome to episode seven of the Pull List Podcast, season two, a bi weekly show about comics, pop culture, and faith. On today's episode of The Pull List, we've got a great show for you. We're going to hit the latest news that you need to know, our poll recommendations from the past two weeks, and our favorite new number ones. This is The Pull List Podcast, so get ready, strap yourselves in, and prepare yourselves for We've Got Comic Sign. Better put the word out, get ready for the nerd out, better put specs on, better bring next. Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the Pull List Podcast. My name is Chris Poirier, and with me, as always, is the one and only Hector. And Hector has published his seventh book in a series. It's actually, what, your tenth book overall, but it's the seventh in the series? Did I get that math right? But Hector's got yeah, a new yes book no. out. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll let him correct me now because, you know, he, he's published, and Chris is published in Hector's books, and that's it. So... Hector, tell us about what wonderful journey you've been on and what came out. It was this past week. Faith and Fandom 7, the final book until the next one. Until the next one, out. right. Um, and uh, it, it's out, and it's the weird thing of not having cons to be the vehicle for that. Because normally, you know, it's you. I try to publish specifically to have at cons and... I'm in a conless society at the moment. Um, yeah. I've got some local stores that are going to carry it and everything else, but it's pretty much, this is the first time I've had to rely primarily online. So it's just weird, but um, it's going good. I feel and- that. So for folks that don't know what, what is a faith and fandom book in a nutshell? Okay. Um, faith and fandom is basically a book series of devotional and, devotional Bible studies on pop culture, nerd culture, video games, comic books, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they usually have about 20 chapters per book and really are just like the spiritual connections I've made with pop culture stuff over like the last year. And sometimes they like work like a year in review outside of like stuff that has been revisited. So like, Mm -hmm. uh, the newest one had like a whole section on Ahsoka Tano and church hurt. Um, it had uh, with um, as Mike Perna uh, had mentioned to us, you know, we he had talked about Alfred and uh, the church is supposed to be more like Alfred than Batman. And with Tom King, oh right, yep, do, do it, killing off Alfred. I did a chapter on, you know, spoilers. Man, what that was like a year ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was a year ago, but does someone will complain? You know how it is. Alfred's dead. Um, <gasps> you should know. And it's yeah, brutal. And by the way, they did that in, in one of the more recent issues I was reading, um, mm-hmm. where I want it might have been Detective. I'd have to actually go pick the book back up. Um, I don't remember. It's Detective or Batman, but uh, that, I think he, Batman ninety four. Which save it for the podcast. But I'll save, I'll yeah, save it for the we podcast. we re, we, re, we revisit that. Yeah, that is right. That is in there. Oh my gosh, that was brutal. Um, but yeah, there's it's just different stuff that's covered in there. So there's a lot of comics, pop culture, and things of those nature that uh, just do independent Bible studies that go with it, and they're in no order. So book seven just dropped. So you know you don't have to have read to have read the previous six. It's literally if if you like the stuff that's covered, read that one. So yeah, we'll we'll go ahead and drop the uh, the linkage there to the Amazons. Uh, where you can purchase all of Hector's wonderful books there. And as Hector said, that all of them cover kind of that particular year or things in pop culture that came up or directly impacted. So you you don't have to start at one and go to seven, though uh, I'm sure every um, writer and artist would love you to buy all seven books. But you can pick and choose the stuff that, you know, speaks to you and you're interested in and you can dive in really at any point and – yeah, it's it's been neat because honestly, part of the reason I wanted to talk about it, it's not just an advertisement for Hector. It's that it's how I it's how I met Hector once upon a time, all these years ago, and it's why him and I have hung out and done cool things over. You know, it's been a hot minute because yeah. I think technically 2013 would have been when we met the first time. So it's crazy to think it's been like seven years. Um, on and off and then two years almost of the pull is podcast so yeah it's it's who we are in our nature and it's neat that i mean come on hector you you've written one of these once 
a year for the last seven years. And then with a couple years with a few other little random books out there too. So it's just like oddballs. So yeah. Yeah. So that's our friend Hector, a, a published author of the Amazon and devotional world of pop culture, which there's only a handful of folks really camping out in. So it's awesome to have Hector along for the ride and that you guys can pick up his stuff and check out kind of how his brain works and how some of us crazy Christians and in pop culture actually work. And it's been an awesome journey. So, yep, book seven available now. And you can check that out in the show notes. So from there, we'll kind of transition into oh, our regular. Oh, just, yeah, just point it. of interest. Like, uh, you know, our one of the, one of the things that uh, just kind of struck me when we were talking about our first podcast started with Batman 53 and yep. um I did a chapter on that and there's been a Tom King centric chapter for the last 3 books. So the pull list has lasted 3 yep. um no no two Faith and Vanity books. I don't remember. Yep. Something like that. But you were just I think you were just finishing or just planning out the first one because basically that chapter on 53 became kind of our pilot episode and that's where the journey began so for everyone who's interested go all the way back in the feed to the beginning and find our episode on batman 53 and you can see kind of how all those things shook out and how we became who we are today but you know that uh, we went from batman so. 53 in the beginning and then the newest book had batman 73 through like 84 so mm -hmm. so that's pretty cool anyway go on sorry so it's awesome stuff. And so that's industry news. It's just industry news at home for all of us here at the Polis Podcast and Faith and Fandom and Love Thy Nerd. So let's jump on into the industry writ large because, again, despite things kind of being slow at the moment overall, there's a ton of stuff still going on in the comic book industry. And we want to keep you guys up to date. So uh, let's jump on in to our news feed and let's see what we got. Well, we got all kinds of craziness, but I think probably the best thing to start you guys off with is, as you figured out by now, almost no conventions are taking place in 2020. Um, the further we go in the year, the more keep continue to fall. Dragon Con finally uh, pulled um, and other shows Did that Dragon were Con pushing pulled? late. Yes. Shut your mouth. Yeah, last week. Um, so even though they were probably legally allowed to here in Georgia, wow. I think they made the decision to not and that they probably reached the point that their insurance would actually cover the cancellation. So, yep, things are getting a little Six sparse. Days ago, even as I'll be danged. Yep. Um, but That's how you know when a you're lot on of shows. Like a, a Christian podcast with pastors. <laughs> right? I'll be <laughs> dang. Like, well, dang. Golly gee. <laughs> or there's suddenly just a blank spot. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's, it's like Father and Frenzy um, albums when they would put bleeps over words that weren't cuss words just to sound cool. Right. <laughs> uh, we, we, we never do that. Never. Um, so, oh, bless you. San Diego <laughs> Comic Con was canceled, but they, like a handful of other shows, have decided that they are going to do some type of digital online version of their show. So if you haven't been keeping up, San Diego at Symbol Home uh, is going to be July 22nd through the 25th. And they have their panel schedule up. We will drop the link in to the show notes for you. And you can – all those are going to be simulcast on their YouTube network. far as I can tell so far, there doesn't appear to be any cost structure applied to what San Diego's programming is going to be, at least for the moment. I don't know if they'll do VIP tiers for like prime stuff or not, but because San Diego is such an important marketing tool for so many folks in the comic book industry – there's a lot of stuff starting to show up on that panel list that everyone's like, wait, 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 hold up. <laughs> so the good news is, is the industry is at least getting some of this stuff slotted for a virtual San Diego. Cause I guess they figured it out that most of us just watch all the trailers that drop at San Diego anyway, <laughs> Right. Um, that they might as well do the exact same thing to gain the, the benefits. And we've already seen a couple things kind of pop out of that. And 
So from Marvel already, we're seeing kind of their fall schedule slash early next year start to solidify. And one of the books that was solicited to return this year, but literally COVID like murdered it, um, and they've reconfirmed is they are going to bring back the old school Werewolf by Night series. Um, and apparently there will be a panel on that and what that's going to look like, what the creative team is going to be, and kind of how they revision the return of that. And for those of you that don't know, Werewolf by Night um, gave us a lot of other characters that you know of. Um, it's where we got Moon Knight um, from way back in the day. And I do believe Werewolf by Night also was the home of Blade before he had any of his own original stuff. So it's kind of that universal monsters, old school creep show type book for Marvel. Um, so it's making return as more people kind of enjoy that horror, um, genre type stuff. But if you're into it, be on the lookout because we should be hearing some stuff at San Diego about what werewolf by night is going to look like as a series going forward for Marvel. So that's kind of cool. I dig it. There was some neat art from the old school days and some cool stories. So we'll see if they bring us something new. Did you ever get into any of the old werewolf? I know some folks like it's a love hate relationship. A lot of people have with, I legitimately never heard of it until you started talking right now. (laughs) Um, yeah, nope. So you can go do some research on that. It's pretty neat. Um, cause there was that time period that kind of everybody had that like creep show esque type stuff. And they were, serialized but had kind of like monster of the week or month type stuff but yep that's where you get a couple cool old school marvel characters from history at least and then the thing that jumped out at me simply by the list of people that was listed for the panel i'm going to give you a list of names and i'm going to tell you right now that they're all in the same book and i just want to gauge your particular your response to this but um, DMC, Daryl, um, I- Amy Chu, okay. Larry Hama, and Rob Gu- uh, Guroy are all coming together to do a book called Out of This World. And it's a DMC joint, literally is one of his main things because that, that's a line from one of his songs. And all those creators are apparently involved in this project. So and they're will slated it be for- on his label, like the DMC label? I don't know the full details, but I believe that's at least the intention. There's literally that we know that it's a panel, that it's about that book, and that that's the creative team is what we know. If you're not aware, um, DMC from the hip hop group run DMC of classic fame has his own yep. comic book label called DMC, which is Daryl Makes Comics. Makes Comics. Yep. And <laughs> it's really cool because... Hector and I both have had the pleasure of meeting um, Daryl at shows in North Carolina, and he is an amazingly humble, just neat, creative. And what's really cool about this story is the reason he's in comics, and I don't know if you ever heard this part of the story, Hector, because I didn't – I kind of finally put all the pieces together, is he wanted to start in comics. And the hip-hop thing actually, like, hit, and he's like, got to get that bread, and did and now that he's like i did that we rocked it we're part of hip-hop history he went back to comics because it's what he really loves and he's like i got money i can do what i want so i'm gonna pull together good creatives and tell stories because that's what i love and i love everything about that statement (laughs) that's fantastic right and it's really neat because we've had a few friends at shows that literally like met him at a show and he's like, Oh, you're a creator. And they're like, yeah, here's some stuff. And then like four months later, we'd see that they worked together on a project Um, that he's just really huge into allowing people to demonstrate their talent and then to do stuff. And I just love that about, about Daryl and just that, yeah, he he's famous enough um, from Run DMC, but he's super approachable. So if you see that he's going to be listed at a show, go see him. He's an amazing guy to talk to and a lot of fun um, that I'm glad that I get to finally talk about uh, DMC comics here on the show. And maybe maybe we should try to shake that tree, see if, if Daryl would actually come our way. I can't make any promises, but that'd I've be done, fun. I did uh... – 
some moderating on a, of a panel with him in Charlotte. And sure. Um, we've had a few conversations and he actually asked Vincent who, if you're not familiar, Vincent is one of my yep. co ministry folks on faith and fandom. He actually asked Vincent to do some stuff with him, but I don't th- yep. know if that panned out, but no, I know it didn't pan out, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens. It happens. But, uh, He's he's a really fun dude, and he and I'm just curious to see what that's going to be about because that's a crazy cross section of creatives, uh, right there. Um, seeing Larry Hama, who you know, original dude Joe. on GI Joe and all Wolverine. that good stuff, um, and Amy Chu, who's been doing a ton of different things, and Rob was one of the co um, creators on the book Chu. Not related. Don't get confused. Um, but it's just a neat lineup, so I'm digging it. So those are just like a two little picks of what may be coming out of San Diego in the next couple of weeks. And so suddenly I'm excited about a show that isn't technically happening but is happening. So I'm starting to get the comic book tingles again, which is awesome because, to be honest, I was starting to get a little worried that – this big break and then a lack of shows in the summer was going to do considerably more damage than it already has, unfortunately. But I'm starting to hear of new projects and ways for them to be announced. So I'm getting excited again. And so I'm probably going to try to do as much as I can with San Diego online. And we'll try to get you guys plugged in during that week of that show so you can see what's going on. We're, like I said, the link is in the show notes, which gives you a link to the schedule of all the panels they currently have scheduled but rumors are they're still solidifying that schedule so there's a lot going to be coming from san diego in the next couple weeks so that's awesome i can't wait and that's one um, of the things too is i've been um i was part of an online con uh two weeks ago um fayetteville fayetteville did their online con and yeah i enjoyed it um but I don't think it was the experience they wanted. Mm. And I think that they are um, trying to figure out what the rest of life looks like at the moment with that. Um, Yeah. And I know that some folks have tried it and had moderate success. I know that some folks have tried it and it's been miserable. I don't know that anyone's tried the online call thing or online con thing and it be stellar but if anybody can do it it's you know san diego yeah uh, i'm really curious to try to see more details about because they talk about their virtual exhibit hall too and that's the part that i feel like a lot of people are struggling with um so I'll, i'll be curious to see i mostly am looking forward to seeing what they do so i can jump in and be like okay how what did they do and is it good and like you said, if anyone's going to nail quality, here's hoping it'll be San Diego. So well, definitely what, not what's dull really funny moments. is this might be some people's only chance to ever make it in the exhibit hall because <laughs> that's right. You like there were still even being there last year there. You you had to win lottery tickets to get into half of the exhibit hall. Woo. So like I couldn't go to the like certain sections of the exhibit stuff I never even saw because I could, didn't win a lottery ticket. So I don't know. That's crazy. Uh, interesting. Well, we'll certainly be giving you more as we learn about what their full schedule looks like and try to bring you stuff as that goes on, because that's what Hector and I do for you is we absorb so much industry news and then try to, bite it down into small pieces so everyone can enjoy my daughter um, legit just was like dad can we watch parks and rec i'm like no honey i've got work to do and i'm reading comic books so <laughs> right it's like what are you doing i'm preparing get off me this is work um, i'm reading doom patrol so that the people can enjoy these things <laughs> right um so what else do we got um Oh, the rest of the news is actually fascinating. Like San Diego online and all that. And Daryl like bringing forward that creative team was pretty awesome. But Marvel actually listened to retailers and fans in the last couple of weeks. Now, all of you are now starting to do the calculus in your head of which particular Marvel thing is he about to say. And 
Interestingly enough, between the two companies that really got a lot of flack for we're going to do digital first or we're going to end a couple of our lower print run uh, books on digital only, Marvel came back and went, okay, message received. We will print these books. Um, (laughs) So the new Valkyrie book that was supposed to be digital only is going to be in print. I think they promised on finishing a couple of the other series that they weren't. I don't remember if my Ant-Man was on that list. Ant-Man is on that uh, list. Woohoo! Ant-Man is on that list. Um, so I'm super excited. It looks like most of the stuff they originally canceled um, for imprint actually is back. And I need to say something incredibly clear right here. Marvel almost never does something like this. Um, they usually are like, nope, we made that decision. It's how we money make. Um, deal with it. And in the economy of things that are going on right now, it's an interesting little move for them because DC is basically sitting on their side going, nope, this is the way forward. Deal with it. And DC isn't moving on a lot of their stuff. And I think Hector and I will talk about it here before the end of the news segment. But it's one of the concerns that I've been hearing from a lot of uh, retailers in the last couple of weeks is DC went from, they built up a ton of really good goodwill within the retailer direct market. And in the last two months have literally tear, tore down almost all of the work that they've done in being very quiet, being very standoffish and just not even giving glimpses behind the curtain that that relationship between retailers and publishers usually is well, they can peek behind the curtain. So we know what's coming and they're just not getting that right now. So Marvel making a concession, knowing that these types of conversations are occurring in their competitors is really interesting to me. And I'm now super excited that I can get the rest of my Ant-Man series. Cause that's all that really matters is that Chris gets to finish reading Ant-Man. I know it's only two issues, but it's important to me. So fascinating stuff. Well, um, I mean, you get Ant Man, and I don't get more Lopdell Red Hood. So the world is not just. <laughs> the world is not just, and that I mean is just an entirely separate issue from even just DC being DC. But yeah, Hector had a rough news week. <laughs> yes. Um. So, and. <sighs> On the other side of things that sort of don't make sense is free comic book day is usually the first Saturday in May. And obviously COVID said, no, you can't have comics. There is no joy in life anymore. And the industry was has been trying to figure out what they're going to do. And that decision has been made. And congratulations, everyone. You now get eight weeks of free comic book summer? Question mark. Um, and you heard that correctly and we've put the link in the show notes because it's kind of convoluted and complicated, but what you need to know is that starting July 15th, so this coming, um, Wednesday, when you hear the show is going to be the first week of all those. And I think it's an average of three to five books per week are going to be available. Now per the actual schedule, it is on Wednesdays. But as Hector and I learned as we talked to a couple different retailers, the rules are flexible enough that the shops can decide how they're going to do this. So some shops are going to have stuff on Wednesdays. Some are opting to hold for the weekend so they can have bigger events. Some are even opting to hold for maybe one or two big days, even though the books are available. So for free comic books this summer, you're going to need to keep an eye on your local shop and what they're doing. Because I know mine is going to make them available, but probably hold them to the weekend uh, so he can do different sales and whatnot. To tr- Because Free Comic Book Day usually brings people to the st- shops and are the biggest days of sales for comic stores. So it being spread out across eight weeks is going to be an interesting experiment. Well, um, what do you hear locally with, for you? Yeah, well, Just like even with Negan Lives, like if you're not familiar, uh, Negan Lives that dropped um, was free – to retailers and exclusive right. to print just to get people in local comic book shops. And that was awesome. Yep. But like, that was a gift directly from Kirkman that th- they didn't pay shipping on it. They didn't pay cost of books. They literally got um, free copies of those, including 
collectible variants, which means that pretty much 100% of the income from that book went in the pockets of the retailers in a time they needed it. Yeah. But like, uh, so I have two shops I frequent, which is uh, Kessel Run Comics in Elizabethtown, North Carolina, and Dragon's Lair in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Dragon's Lair is saving their books to the weekend. And what they are going to do is they are going to basically make mini cons for the foreseeable future. And each Saturday, they are going to bring in two artists, writers, comic book creators, whatever, to sit in the shop and basically have a little artist alley wing. So nice. they'll have free comics and artists, guests. Um, the Elizabethtown shop is literally waiting until the last day of all of it. Yep. So he's going to gather I've... everything and then have one big free comic book day months after everybody else's stuff is gone and like where everybody can just come in. And so that'll be good and bad depending on what you're looking for. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so that that matches a lot of what I'm hearing as well is that no two shops really kind of have the same idea, which is both the beauty of the direct market, but also, as you noted, the complication because either places that will sell out in the first couple of weeks, well, give away, um, the places that hold stuff will still have them. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how the dynamics of all that play out. But your free books are coming. It's just they're gonna be all over the place so definitely check with your local shops on what you're interested in and make sure that you're still first in line you know how it be that's can be one of the craziest days at a comic shop and now it could potentially be eight times crazy um good times and then finally it's not fully comic books but when i saw it (laughs) my jaw almost dropped i don't know if you caught this last week hector but the create Gary Larson, the creator of Far Side Comics, you know the calendars that like a lot of yeah, yeah. our generation grew up with and all that cool stuff, released some of his first comics in literally the last twenty five years last week. It's on his website, it's on his Facebook, and I think it's three new independent Far Sides. I just thought that was cool. It was crazy because I also sat there and went, "It's really been twenty five years." Ah. <sighs> I don't know why that makes me feel old. Because you're old. That's been a long time. I mean, like, legit, dude. I meant, there's no way around that. Like, nope. there hasn't been far side since we were in middle school. Right. We could get those books, like, at the at the book fair or something like that. And that was, like, our childhood. And then it's like, what happened? Well, kids, there's new comics. Go to the webs. It's fun. So, that's what you need to know. Um, actually... I think there was one more thing you, you need to know. Hector, um, you mentioned, I think it was before the show got started, um, reminding me, because I'm a bad person apparently, um, that DC Comics this week were now under their two new distributors. That's and right. you had a chance right. to talk. You had a chance to talk with your local shop about it, and I did as well. And we just wanted to give everybody kind of a little feedback on that because that was the one question mark everyone had from Diamond to these two new distributors who have never distributed comics en masse before um, got your store, their DC Comics this week, or in some cases didn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, so what did you hear from your your local guy? And then I'll be more than happy to kind of share what I saw kind of across the industry uh, briefly so people can kind of be aware of what's been going on. So I straight up, right when I was checking out with my books, asked my dude how the new distributor worked out for him. And he kind of almost begrudgingly said it actually worked out really well. Um, hmm. The packaging was really good. As far as like making sure that they weren't just like haphazard, um, they got them. And here's the the big distinction: they got them at the exact same price they were already getting them. Oh, interesting. So, because so, one of the big things is that they thought they were going to have to pay more. Right. And my dude said he paid the exact same price he's always paid. There was no upcharge. It's good. And um, and that in a lot of ways. Um, it got there earlier. It was packaged better. And if it continues like this, even if Diamond goes back, or if DC goes back to Diamond as an option, he'd stick with what he's doing. 
with the new stuff. Interesting. That's great. Um, I know I've heard some some small shops say similar things that their experience was really solid. Um, my shop unfortunately did get a miss poll, so they got issued a bunch of stuff that they didn't order and shorted all of the ones that they didn't that this is this is typical comic stuff so that that's going to happen pretty much no matter what but on the positive side again did get things because part of it is their distribution model is to have stuff by tuesdays um versus wednesdays so it's going to show up early no matter what um a few people did have complications because that shipping order happened over the fourth of july holiday weekend and one thing that I definitely heard from a lot of folks is if they had questions or they had issues, they all tried calling on Friday, which was technically the holiday, but was also the first distribution weekend of these new companies. And it was clear that not a single one of them worked. <laughs> um, the average um, complaint from folks was waiting on hold for two hours and then being hung, hung up on um, with absolutely no um, – explanation or whatnot a lot of folks then later found out that if they emailed their questions they would actually get answered so one of the main things that that came from though is everyone realized that it wasn't communicated initially how to report damages shorts or overages so 100 percent of people that had problems had to call and then didn't get anybody for the first 72 hours of their new um distribution so which is it just wasn't perfect when you've got money and business <laughs> yep. riding on that yeah, uh, um, and with the next Batman book coming out, which is huge, and they're in the they're just kicking off the Joker War, and there were two Joker War books in that order. It's don't mess with Bat. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, very similarly, they're like outside of you know those hiccups, which technically are very similar to experiences a lot of them had with Diamond. Um, they said the same thing of. The quality of shipper and also the biggest thing was like variants or valuable books were packaged at a level n they've never seen before. And that has been one of the longest standing complaints from retailers about high value books is you usually print fewer of them so they're worth more. And then when you ship them and they get damaged, it is – they usually hold back less to replace those because that's the point of the collectability, which means if – you have a shipper that's just damaging literally everything that goes into a shipper. At some point, you're not going to be able to replace the book that your shipper damaged. And that has plagued the industry for the last decade. And everyone's like, yeah, these guys clearly want the good stuff to show up in one piece. So I think we're going to continue to see how it goes. But for the most part, despite that one little hiccup on the, the holiday weekend, most people seemed fairly positive. So – we continue down the road to see kind of what happens next. But if you are missing a title or something like that happened, that's probably what happened. But for most of you, you probably heard the word diamond associated with that mistake in the past. So it's not new. It was just different. So, yeah, I think that's going to do it for the news for this week. There was a lot of stuff going on, but we really want to focus on this to be able to give you all an idea of what the industry is truly, truly doing and just truly about. So, Thanks for coming to us for all that inside knowledge. It's what Hector and I do um, as our day job, just pouring over the internet, talking to our friends in the industry, to shop owners and everything so that we can deliver some of the inside stuff that would explain on what happens to your comics. all the complaints my church has about my performance. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. No, no. Uh, you do both fine. If they're listening, Hector is a wonderful person. <laughs> he, he manages his time well. Um, so... <sighs> Like, I don't play I think Animal the, Crossing in staff meetings, but whatever. Go ahead. Ooh. Uh, well, you know, to each their own. But other than the news, the things that we want you guys to know about is what did come out the last couple weeks and what we found particularly interesting, especially as new books. So, Hector, let's jump in and give folks a little bit of an idea. There weren't a ton of new books, and just briefly, that's something everyone's going to notice as well, is DC and Marvel production is way down right now. Um, that a lot of books are very slow to get back up and running, but it's looking like August, September is when we'll see things return mostly normal-ish. So the options on the shelves are definitely thinner if you've looked, and it's just because people are still catching up and we're still 
doing the COVID thing to an extent, just it's different. So, so what did you find in your poll over the last two weeks that just spoke to you in some way? It's a lot of, you know, it's not always good. It's not always bad, but we try to give you an idea of what's out there. So I didn't really understand the full extent of how naked two weeks ago was going to be. <laughs> right. Um, I was not prepared. And so, as I've mentioned, I think maybe on the last episode, I am doing more intentional effort to uh, give my patronage to actual physical local comic book shops during this time. Um, And so, each comic book shop is at least 35 to 40 minutes from me, if not an Mm -hmm. hour with traffic. So, uh... It, it's it's an honest to goodness investment to drive to a comic book shop. So I drove to a comic book shop two weeks ago and found out that neither DC nor Marvel had books. And I'm like, well, crap. Um, <laughs> there were like four books on the shelf. Like well, almost not kidding. Well, I, dude, what was crazy is the shop I went to uh, didn't even put books out. Oh, man. Uh, like Mine he, did, and I should have taken a picture of it because it was it was it was kind of surreal. It was like, wait, what? <laughs> he said it wasn't worth it. <laughs> they were organizing some Spider Mans they had bought from somebody else, and they didn't even put books out. He figured if people knew what was coming, they'd come ask for it. Um, oh wow! And I also wanted to buy the Negan Lives books, you know, to support um, folks, and you know. You know, it is that, but like it was disappointing. But uh, so jumping into stuff that actually pulled two weeks ago, um, I, let me just hit uh, Negan Lives. Um, one of mm-hmm. the things yep. is if you read the final issue of The Walking Dead, one of the statements in Robert Kirkman's letter in the back of the book is that he's like, and for the record, Negan Lives. Um, so, like, titling the book that was, you know, basically a nod to the fact that just a year prior, The Walking Dead had ended. And I don't know if you noticed that that was the timing of it, is that, yep. uh, you know, it was almost exactly a year later um, from the end of The Walking Dead. And his but, letter uh, in the end shares some some echoes of the previous letter, which I thought was really good. Because it basically does the... You know, is this the last story for Negan? Question mark. So, and that, and that's the thing. Like, um, I went into this knowing I was just supporting the retailers. Um, and while this was a, uh, you know, a decent little blink into the Negan world, um, yep. it felt like a post-credit scene that I don't think I would have sat through the credits for. And um, it was good. It was Negan. It was Negan being Negan. And Negan having... It was a, so It was so Negan. <laughs> yeah, that was the thing. It was like, oh, look, here's some curse words. Here's some violence. And Done. some irony and loss. Okay, cool. Um, yep. But that book alone was not worth me driving 40 miles one way. Um I would have rather just PayPal'd my local shop four bucks, um, and just saved my gas. But uh, <laughs> but if you are a Walking Dead fan, it is worth reading on that level. Um, yeah. So there's that. Um, I will say, deceased dead planet. Um, number one was dope. Um, I have you. If you've listened to this, I've long been beating the drum of deceased is really good. Um, I personally thought, um, the one shot with Mr. Miracle and the magical crew was fantastic. I thought deceased unkillables was the best iteration so far, but deceased the proper was a great story. And this one is a direct sequel to deceased proper. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know where this exactly falls in the time. This falls five years later after deceased proper. Um, And if, if you're not familiar, basically uh, dark side 
merges the anti-life equation with the internet, which is, again, I've said this before. DC's done this before. They did it in Final Crisis. Um, but it turns people into zombies, etc. And all the heroes go out swinging. And, but um, both Batman and Superman died, uh, as well as Wonder Woman, um, in the original run, which is, you know, old now. Um, this picks up five years later where now Damien is Batman, John is Superman, um, you know, Wonder Girl is Wonder Woman, and Black Canary is like a leader in the Green Lantern Corps. So it's a cool story. Um, and they get basically a call back to Earth. They've been living in space and safe for five years, and they get called back to Earth and are teased with the concept that there's a cure. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how good it's going to be, but I'll say this, that, um, the writing, uh, for this is great. I have strongly come to realize that Tom Taylor is legit. One of my favorite writers, um, for DC, um, for a long time now. Um, and it's one of those things that when I read a book without paying attention to who writes it, and I find myself pre- pleasantly surprised, and go look, it's usually Tom Taylor. Um, nice. So he he has steadily become one of like just the most pleasant surprises to come out of DC Comics in a while. And if you, even if you don't like zombies, if you like seeing character depth in short bubbles this is this is one of the best books i can recommend um i actually yeah, i just, was really impressed i mean i skipped unkillables which you yeah i'm disappointed in your before life yeah you 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 told me how much i screwed up so i was like well i can't let another dc a uh, deceased uh pass and i picked this well, up you need and, to go get unkillables dude yeah, I know I do, but at least I haven't missed the new ones. And Nuh-uh. the end of this, this one made me go, whoa. Well, and I have a question on this one because of Unkillables, and I'm going to have to look it uh. back up. Um, because there's a character that I thought died in Unkillables, like, di- like a zombie that died in Unkillables that is back. And I thought for sure that zombie mm, met okay. their fate in this it like in the previous incarnation so like they referenced unkillables in this when they referenced ivy's garden um, um oh, which, okay uh which if you if you read unkillables but not if you read deceased but not unkillables um the last survivors on earth of a squad of heroes villains and orphan children are all living in an impenetrable, even to superhero levels, um, a garden in the middle of Gotham that Ivy is guarding 24 mm. seven. Um, that not even like wonder woman was able to break in. So, um, like everybody that is alive on earth is in that garden. Um, and so they were going to reference the, or go save them. And uh, I'm actually checking my uh, one question. Okay, never mind. I was wrong. The person I thought that died didn't. Um, so cool. But I'll say this. Uh, it's worth it. But Unkillables is still my favorite. And I think you need to go read that, Chris. Uh uh, folks, yeah. you're, here, you're hearing it first. I am officially declaring a uh, podcast boycott. Um, <laughs> episode eight is not happening until Chris reads these books. Um, oh, I'm being, we're being, you're canceling us <laughs> until I read something? Oh, man. Just maybe. No, not really, but, you know, it, it's strongly suggested. Um, but uh, I also really love the art in Unkillables. But anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Deceased. Dead Planet, number one. Super dope. Um, X-Force, number 10. Um, picks back up. And I, I'll say this. From Marvel's end, this is falling into Doomsday Clock levels 
of it's been so long since I've remember I've read a story. <laughs> what's going that, on? Mm-hmm. That I forgot what's going on. Yep. Um, I have and, one of those on my list too for this so week. That's totally happening. So we're gonna have to pick up steam here. Um, but X Force is good, and one of the things that I you know a mystery, so to speak, that was previously stated is that Domino before she died. Um, in a few issues back, told Colossus, uh, like with a hundred percent clarity and certainty, um, when I'm brought back, don't take away any of my scars and don't take away any of my traumatic memories of what's happened. Mm-hmm. Um, she wanted to come back completely intact with all of her flaws, and but when she's brought back, she's healed. And doesn't have any of her painful memories, even though she specifically made that clear to everyone. So, um, there's a twisted game afoot. Um, and also with the fact that Kitty Pride is the first one that is not able to be brought back. I, I'm, I'm enjoying that. So, X-Force picks that up. It's a Domino Wolverine adventure um, at a nutshell, but they actually explore that dialogue and I enjoyed that. And also just, um, kicking off the path to a Joker war as a uh, Batman 94 and detective 1023. Um, detective, you literally have, um, Joker on a path to, uh, unleash talons. Um, mm. and so that's fun. So Joker doing that, but then Batman 94, we get, um, Batman, and so that's where the Alfred thing was, right? You read yep. that, okay? Um, Batman's, you know, hallucinating, and he's seeing Alfred like talking to him with a snap neck, looking all traumatizing. And I'm like, oh no, that's horrible! Don't, <laughs> I don't like it. Um, <laughs> oh no! But and again, this isn't the most original story, but uh, Batman's lost his entire home, his entire company, and he's penniless. And Joker now has all the resources of Wayne Enterprises. This story without the Joker has happened before where Batman's had his bank account drained and Lucius Fox actually was part of it. It was not a popular story. Um, And I honestly, I don't think it ever got resolved. I think it was somewhere around uh, New 52 or the run that was going right before 52 started. Um, Mm. But it's an old story, but like it's, you know, a lot of tropes that are being brought back up but i'll say this um batman 94 packed a punch i enjoyed it it um and as far as like quality batman this is not a book i'm regretting reading just putting it that way um if you read 93 the harley issue is still up in the air yep um and uh punchline and harley are still in the wind yeah and so that's uh well punchline's not she's having a conversation with joker in it oh that's right we see her briefly so uh -uh. yeah harley is the one in the wind and that's the question to be had um so but it was totally worth it so um that's me what do you got so i read mostly independent and marvel this week i mean i obviously read dc east planet and batman 94 which were pretty awesome but Marvel kind of having some of their stories back on the racks. I wanted to catch up on two really random Marvel books that I've been enjoying, and that's Doctor Strange, Surgeon Supreme, which I've mentioned on the show before. And issue number five came out this week, and I kind of had to do the same thing where I was like, what is going on? Because it's been a minute. Um Looking things over, all the advertisements in the Marvel books right now are for April, which means the last time technically we had proper um, books in those lines were March or February. So that's why it feels like I don't remember what's going on. Um, But Surgeon Supreme is basically that story I've been talking about that Strange is doing his day job of he's been able to be healed of his past physical Um, maladies which didn't allow him to be a surgeon anymore um and he still is has access to the sorcerer supreme side of him hence surgeon supreme um and the book's entirely about him balancing his duties as a surgeon 
one of the best um, neurosurgeons available and having to like worry about the multiverse and all of the crazy um, mystical things that occur in the universe. And the art's been pretty awesome and the story's been whack job is all get out, but it's a fun little jaunt in that literally half the book is the, oh crap, I have a day job. And the other half is, oh man, literally this crazy space wormhole is being torn open and I got to do something about that right now. And so it's basically, he's not doing either of them well, (laughs) but he's trying. So it's kind of a fun book. It's a really strange setup for a book, but it's, it's been fun. And the other one kind of in the same vein is strange Academy started before COVID and now number two has finally come out. So same thing. It's been a minute, but strange Academy is basically Marvel's new, like, younger teen um, book that, you know, Champions kind of ended, which was a teen-based team, and now we have Strange Academy, which is kind of more of your X-Men slash other mystical um, it's characters. It's Umbrella Academy. Right. It, well, Umbrella Academy or um, Harry Potter, insert whatever. They're going to a private school to hone their skills as basically mystics um, in the Marvel Universe. And it plays off from all those things because, you know, like Dr. Sh- Doctor Strange is um, part of the cadre there, one of the professors. And like literally the two – these two books actually overlapped this month, which was kind of funny um, because he was like, oh, right. I've got that school I got to do too. And so like it's like, hi, look, Strange Academy. Um, and so you've got some – mystical folks like magic is one of the professors and core characters in strange academy so it's just been a ton of fun for that age group and like school-based story like i'm usually not that guy but this has been kind of fun because they're playing off from basically the children of some characters we've been familiar with like dormammu's kid is one of the kids in this going to the the academy and that's just fascinatingly funny (laughs) I don't know why, but it is. Um, so, yeah, I I really recommend that book for someone that's looking for an easy, like not mental, tough uh, read because it's just fun, um, which is what I kind of expect from Marvel's universe, and I dig it. Um, I'm also still reading Firefly, which I constantly come back here and go, I'm not really sure why, and I'm still – of that opinion. The brown coat in me won't let me not, but Firefly 17 came out. Um, Mal's still looking for his mom, but mom hasn't showed up. The big bad that was kind of introduced before is some type of spoiler alert, super soldier, basically that blue sun has created. And so I'm starting to care less. The more I go on, (laughs) if I say anything good about what's going on in the Firefly book right now is I am firmly convinced of how incredibly evil Blue Sun is as a corporation because they really are going for just how evil Blue Sun is at every level in this at this point. It's like, yeah, I think we had a firm understanding of that from the show and everything, but they're really going to that no, we mean it. They're an evil bureaucratic shadow governmenty type of organization and it's like got it. Um and Mal is still balancing the I'm a sheriff, but I'm a criminal thing and that that's a plot now. So congratulations, brown coats. It's a thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking this, this journey is going to end eventually, but I, it's a train wreck. I can't look away from. It makes me sad. Um, and then finally for stuff, I had the opportunity to pick up Robert Kirkman also had out during this period, the prelude graphic novel and free comic book day issue of his new book, firepower. So short version of this is I read the graphic novel, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Awesome art, pretty good story, humorous, but basically close your eyes. Imagine the iron fist story, except this dude can manipulate fire. So it's avatar and iron fist together. Sort of, because it's not really, it's not an elemental bender thing, as more so if he can actually conjure it, which kind of is the bending thing for the Fire Nation. Now that I think about it, it <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it's really broken. And we so just. So it's as if Danny Rand went to the Fire Nation instead of 
the dragon. Right, but like, it's still like up in the hills in the Himalayas, like in a place that only a certain number of people can find. It's not a it's not there, but it's there thing like an Iron Fist. It's just oh, Fire Nation attacked. Right. <laughs> Aw. But let's have some tea. <laughs> and there's some tea moments in this, so who knows? There he could be ripping there. But <sighs> needlessly put, the the prelude is a graphic novel that you can still get. And it was really fun to kind of see the setup of this, that you find out this dude's parents um, were clearly part of some type of martial arts organizations. And one of them mentioned this location and one of them mentions this other basically like criminal enterprise. And you kind of find out that basically his parents were actually part of the criminal enterprise and not the good guys. Um, And he had been spending his entire life trying to find his parents. And through that, he found the good guys, um, which basically had the fire um, thing. And he ends up training with them because they get that he didn't know that. And he doesn't know where his parents are. And they kind of do the, well, we can teach you the right way thing. And that setup was actually really great. There's a lot of other beats that are in there that are really fun. Um, but then you get to the first issue of the actual story and they basically do a 10 years later and, you know, he's not like doing monk stuff up in the Himalayas. He's like mowing his lawn and barbecuing for his two and a half kids, white picket fence, um, neighborhood and that that life suddenly intersects again. And I was like, I don't know if I care now. Somebody might find it cool, but the. The one thing that I just unfortunately feel about a lot of Kirkman's projects lately is his setup for concept is brilliant. Literally the first trade, like Oblivion Song, the first trade was like jaw-dropping, holy crap, where is this story going? Oblivion Song is still on shelves right now, but I literally stopped reading that book a year ago because I was like, why, Robert? Why? And I'm already getting that vibe off this book, and it's like it's not even out yet. <laughs> So it kind of bums me out, but at the same time, I'm telling you, go find the prelude graphic novel. It should be $10, and it's fun. It's pretty, and it's fun. So enjoy it for what it is, because that story alone is great. Um, I'm going to read the first issues when they come out to see if you know the story actually solidifies into something that makes sense. But at the moment, I'm unfortunately skeptical um, as I patiently wait for Robert Kirkman to have a win after Walking Dead, because... In his timeline of things, it kind of goes Walking Dead, and then what's the last thing you remember of Robert Kirkman being like, you have to read this? Walking Dead, like, issue 100? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, And, yeah, and he's done so much for Image, and Skybound as a whole is great now and everything, so it's not me really beating on the guy. It's just, come on, Robert, I know you have it in you. Um, and the beginnings of these stories show that I was like, I don't know if you just have that really good thing. And then it's like, where do I go? And you know, that's the reality of serial comics is you got to go somewhere, bro. So those were my pulls. And, you know, to wrap out the show, uh, Hector and I did read some number ones that we want to tell you about. So mine just off the thing came from two weeks ago when we basically had no books and there was an image book called all America comics. And if it looked and Which, felt by the familiar way, I to read that this week, I picked that up too. Cool. Um, so if it looked and felt familiar, it's because it was supposed to that everything down to the name of the individual being slightly changed and everything is if you remember America from Marvel comics, it is literally the same creative team. And if you also remember Marvel canceled that book only, I don't know if it even made its first year worth a run. Um, And they spend an entire comic straight ripping on what Marvel did. And the short version of this story is they were trying to provide some diversity to the line at Marvel by introducing a character that basically was something other than white and amazing. And the book... Unfortunately, whether it was editorial or otherwise, I mean, I remember selling a fair amount of it, but I know it was not one of their more popular books. And some of those rips come from you don't have to join the Avengers to be awesome because literally there are foils for every Marvel hero and villain 
in this issue that it is a straight satire that everyone's sitting here going, is somebody going to get sued? <laughs> but they're all – it's technically straight satire. They don't rip on direct copyrights, but it's very clear who everybody is in the book. And this is one of those times that Chris looks at the comic book industry and just does a golf clap because it was 32 plus pages of just straight satire on the circumstances of the book being canceled and the reality of the character. And they call it a one shot, but I kind of hope it's not because they set up for the, that basically that America over there in Marvel was a mirror universe. That was the evil universe. And we are now seeing the correct universe version of America. I actually really enjoyed the book. So Right? <laughs> I kind of looked at it and went, oh, that's what this book was supposed to look like. So that's why it's listed as a one-shot, but it technically leaves the door open. And I'm hoping that enough people will see it and go, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So, like, I honestly picked it up because... The, one of my local shop dudes was like, I'm pretty sure there's a cease and desist coming in. If I were you, I'd buy it. Right? No. When, once you read it, you'll be like, yeah, somebody's lawyers are not happy right now. But that was my number one pick from that week. Uh, if you can still find it, find it. Because if you read the old series, you will definitely probably get even more than I did out of it. But it should be very obvious, the characters in that book and who they're ripping on. And it's pretty amazing. Um. For me, it was not a new book. It's a new to me book, and I got this new to me book because there were no comics at the store when I went to buy comics. <laughs> it's new um, to me. But uh, I picked up Avatar: The Last Airbender, The Promise Number One, which is a three book arc, and um, it picks up almost verbatim where the show lifts off, leaves off, uh, and then skips a ahead a year. Um. And it has the relationship stuff with Katara and Aang um, to the point that it grosses everyone out um, in a humorous way. Like, I literally cringed the first time I heard I heard Katara call Aang sweetie. Um, I'm like, ew. Um, but uh, so Avatar Aang is doing his thing. Zuko is doing his thing. But uh, Toph has started a metal bending school. And, but the, the deal, the tension comes of this is that, uh, with a few weeks, months, whatever, into his leadership as Fire Lord, uh, Zuko makes Aang promise that if he ever become starts becoming like his father, that Aang will kill him. Um, wow. And he's like, look, dude, I'm at my most clear right now. I'm not corrupted. I haven't bowed to anyone if i ever go rogue i need you to kill me i don't want you to leave me like you did my dad freaking kill me and um then we jump forward a year later and it's to the point where uh zuko is straight up realizing he's slipping um Mm. and it's not out of evil or corruption it's out of pressure and not knowing what to do because one of the poli- and it, it deals with political stuff I straight up never gave thought to, and the fact that now that um, the Fire Nation is supposed to be the good guys, they have still occupied many other regions and set up hmm. colonies. And it deals with the fact that he's saying, "All right, everybody, go back to your nation," and some of these people have been blended together for a hundred years. Oh, wow. And so he's like, look, I need you. If you're a fire nation, get out of the earth bending colony. And like, it's destroying families. It's destroying businesses. And like, they all made the decision together that everybody go home. And now it's putting like Aang and Zuko against each other. And, um, like, uh, it, and there's this tension of Aang's like stressing at the idea that he's going to have to kill him um, if things go rogue. But now they're, they're trying to do political things to fix the problem. Um, so if you just read the first book, which it's not crazy long, it's totally worth it. Um, and it honestly will bring some political dialogue that feels scarily uh, familiar right now to mm. uh, 
Avatar The Last Airbender, and it just it has some seriously good thoughts to it. So uh, uh, the first issue I picked up um, on the shelf, and uh, if your local shop doesn't have it, I'm pretty sure you, they can get it for you. Um, but it is a three book series called The Promise, and so the first issue of that left me highly satisfied and shopping on my phone as soon as I finished it. So that's it for me. Nice, awesome. Well, as some of you might have noticed, uh, we didn't have a recommendation from any of you this week. So I'm here to remind you, we don't always have the market covered in terms of all the things that are out there that we should be reading. And we want to hear from you, our loyal listeners. So you can give us a call at the Pull List Podcast at 706-530-1412 and leave us a 30-second to about a minute message about your favorite read. And you'll be spons- you'll be on the next episode. And we'll be talking about what we missed And what you recommended so that all your friends can hear all the cool things that you have to say and should be reading. And Hector and I can be like, oh, wow, we should read more things, even though we already read a ton of things. But that's what it's there for. Give us a shout at least the Friday before the next show comes out. So that's next Friday, a week from now. So just give us a call and you'll be right here, just like you've heard a couple of other folks uh, earlier in the season. So Take advantage of that. We're here for you. We want to hear what you're reading and share that with the world as well. So ultimately, guys, that's going to do it for us here at the Pull List Podcast. Episode 7 of Season 2 is in the book. See, we've been going a little long today, and my voice is punishing us for it. But it's okay. We're done. Season 2 continues to roll down the tracks. But we couldn't possibly do any of this alone. As many of you know, we take this incredible journey of podcasts and fandom with a bunch of other shows at the Love Thy Nerd Podcast Network. You can check those all out at lovethynerd.com or on the Book of Faces at Love Thy Nerd. So go ahead and check those out. But ultimately, Hector and I just want to thank all of you for choosing us as your primary comic book knowledge factory. Hopefully we filled all of that knowledge for this week. We had a ton of knowledge. And don't leave us hanging, man. Rate and review the show. Share with your friends. Tell other folks that you enjoy what you're hearing. And just share the joy of comics with other folks. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio. I think we're even on SoundCloud now. We're just about everywhere that you can find podcasts. So from Hector and I, deep down, thank you for listening. And remember, read more comics. I'm going to take all seven continents of the game of risk.